Hello, my name is Leaf, and you're listening to Health Righteous. Big thanks to Gabe Gibbs for voicing that station ID. You might have caught him as Elder Price in the Book of Mormon on Broadway or on tour, but you can currently catch him playing the role of Weasel on ABC's Schooled. Since this is our first episode, I want to focus on something that affects everybody, every day, and that is the food we eat. In the first episode of a two-part series that I am calling GMO Giants and Dirty Produce. These are going to touch on the potential dangers and possible benefits of how we interact with these genetically modified organisms, or GMOs. There's a lot we can talk about with genetic modification and engineering, but I'm going to do my best to keep it in the scope of food. Let's start by talking about a brief history of GMOs. In some ways, genetic modification has existed for thousands of years in farming, through selective breeding or artificial selection and plant hybridization. You may be familiar with the history of corn, but did you know that watermelons and peaches have also been cultivated over thousands of years of selective breeding to become the sweet, succulent fruit that we have today? But newer than selective breeding is plant hybridization, with some of the earliest documented cases in the 1890s by cross-pollinating wheat. This technique has evolved over the years, but it has yielded some pretty common foods, like clementines, boysenberries, and plantains. There are possible concerns for this process, though, because the breeder doesn't always know exactly which genes are being introduced to the plants. Some scientists argue that plants produced by classical breeding methods should undergo the same safety testing scrutiny as genetically modified plants. There have been instances where plants bred using these classical techniques have actually become more dangerous. For example, certain varieties of potatoes ended up with toxic amounts of a naturally occurring poison called solanine through breeding. Currently, new potato varieties are typically screened for solanine levels before reaching the marketplace, but we'll be talking more about solanine and other freaky toxins in our episode, Five Everyday Foods That Are Trying to Kill You. Anyway, these aren't the types of genetic modifications that I'm concerned with diving into in this episode. I'm more concerned about GMOs that are modified to resist herbicides, pests, and diseases. All right, herbicides. Let's talk about Monsanto, the giant GMO elephant in the room. Monsanto is owned by pharmaceutical giant Bayer, but here's some backstory. Monsanto is an agrochemical company based in Missouri, and it's the largest producer of genetically engineered seed in the United States. In 1901, they were originally founded as a chemical company that produced artificial substitutes for food and beverage products. You might know them from their most infamous artificial sweetener, Saccharin. But you might also remember that studies began to show that saccharin and other sweeteners revealed correlations to cancer and malignant tumors in animals. Since then, Monsanto has tiptoed away from artificial additives. You might also know them as one of the producers of Agent Orange. Agent Orange is a mixture of two potent herbicides that became infamous by the U.S. military as part of its herbicidal warfare program. Herbicidal warfare is the use of substances primarily designed to destroy the plant-based ecosystem of agricultural food production and to destroy foliage, which provides enemy cover. The government named the mixture Agent Orange because of the orange band that was painted on containers of the material. It ultimately caused major health problems to swaths of the up to 4 million people in Vietnam that were exposed to the chemical, and the United States documented higher cases of leukemia, Hodgkin's lymphoma, and other various kinds of cancer in Vietnam vets that were exposed to it. In 2004, the spokesperson for Monsanto, Jill Montgomery, said Monsanto should not be liable at all for injuries or deaths caused by Agent Orange. But not because they were acting under government contract, but by saying, We are sympathetic with people who believe they have been injured and understand their concern to find the cause. But reliable scientific evidence indicates that Agent Orange is not the cause of serious long-term health effects. So we've got a couple irksome events in the company's past with the saccharin and the Agent Orange. But in 1974, Monsanto brought a new player to the table. Roundup. Roundup is an herbicide that's often used as a weed killer whose active ingredient is glyphosate, or glyphosate. 
Glyphosate is the most commonly used herbicide in the United States by sheer area treated. The way that glyphosate works is by blocking a plant's ability to receive nutrients through what's called the shikimate pathway. Plants, bacteria, and algae all use the seven-step pathway to get nourishment, so blocking this process makes them die off pretty quickly. This is great for home gardeners and everyone who doesn't like to weed, which turns out is a lot of people. In fact, in 1999, Scott's miracle Grow company had the good sense to capitalize on this market and bought exclusive marketing rights to the consumer Roundup products. A neat story about Scott's comes a few years later, when in 2012, Scott's miracle Grow agrees to plead guilty in a federal court and pay $4.5 million in fines for selling 73 million units of bird seed over the course of two and a half years that was coated with a pesticide known to be deadly to birds and fish. Pesticides were added to protect the product from insects during storage, despite the fact that Storeside 2, one of the pesticides used, was clearly marked as toxic to birds. Records show that Scott's own experts warned about the risk in the summer and fall of 2007, and yet Scott's continued to sell the deadly product until March 2008. Their fine was four and a half million dollars for selling 73 million units of poisonous bird seed. That doesn't even begin to cut into their profit made on this product alone. And Scott still holds exclusive rights to marketing Roundup to consumers. The glyphosate in Roundup doesn't discriminate which plants live and which plants die. It's non-selective. So how does this end up getting sprayed on 298 million acres of cropland every year in the United States and end up in 93% of urine samples? A couple ways. The first way is by using it as a desiccant or a drying agent. Monsanto invites farmers to spray it on wheat fields just before harvest to kill the crop plants so they can dry quicker and more evenly. This saves the farmer time and money, especially in Canada, where the growing season is short and moisture can ruin everything. Here's the other way. In 1983, Monsanto scientists published their first case of genetically modifying a plant cell. And in 1991, they start to license technology from a biotech company that generated the first transgenic cotton, soybeans, peanuts, and other crops. In 1996, they acquire this company and are able to start selling their own seeds at scale. What's unique about these seeds is that they've been modified using microorganism genes to be unaffected by glyphosate. So farmers could spray away without any pesky weeds. This is great for farmers, in theory. We'll make sure we're only planting Roundup-ready seeds, grow a single crop, spray, 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 harvest, yay. Some of my patented seeds blow onto your property. Monsanto sues your pants off. My harvest is kind of eh the first year, but they promise it'll get better next year. I grow my crops again, spray, spray, spray. Not any bigger yield than non-GMO crops, but hey, at least there's no weeds. What's beneath the surface is we're not just killing weeds. We're killing off the microbiome in the soil that provides our crop with its nutrients. You may have heard this before. Gut health is overall health. The bacteria in your gut can control your mood, your weight, your energy levels, and your brain. There's more bacteria, fungi, and viruses in your microbiome than cells in your body. And we're learning now that bacterial flora, or lack thereof, can predict or produce some types of cancer. Well, just like how our bodies are reliant on diverse and healthy bacteria and organisms, so is the soil. No organisms in the soil, no nutrients, dead soil. And we're just planting one crop, so there's no nutrient diversity coming into the soil that way either. We need nutrients in the soil to become nutrients in the crops. So what's the solution? Fertilizer. Luckily, after World War II, scientists learned that they could create synthetic fertilizers as byproducts of petroleum, most commonly in the form of nitrogen, N, phosphorus, P, and potassium, K. Spray away! N, P, K, N, P, K. Wait, synthetic fertilizers also kill the bacteria in the soil. Dag. It's estimated that human activity has hastened the rate at which erosion is occurring globally by between 10 and 50 times. 
This shows up as decreases in agricultural productivity and total ecological collapse in nature, both brought on by the loss of the nutrient-rich upper layers of soil. And in some cases, the eventual end result is desertification. Yes, this is a real word in which a relatively dry area of land becomes a desert, typically losing its bodies of water as well as vegetation and wildlife, and it can be caused through the overexploitation of soil through human activity. Yikes, yikes. But let's take a look at our crops. The fruit of our labor. We've got cotton, corn, and soybeans. Those are the most common genetically engineered crops grown in the United States. In 2012, genetically engineered soybeans accounted for 93% of all soybeans planted, and GE corn accounted for 88% of corn planted. Those are FDA numbers from 2012. It's the future now, so I'd argue that it's unlikely that these figures have gone down. And this is where 84% of glyphosate applied in farm settings is applied every year, according to the EPA. A big portion of these crops are going into the livestock feed to keep our burgeoning beef industry moving forward. The United States is projected to produce 27 billion pounds of beef in 2019 alone. If this happens, this will be the most beef ever produced in one year. The other crops might end up as corn starch, corn syrup, corn oil, canola oil and soybean oil, or as sugar from sugar beets. A fun little factoid, the name canola was actually a condensation of can from Canada and OLA, meaning oil low acid. It's referring to erucic acid, which showed to have toxic effects on the heart at high enough doses in animal trials. But I digress. All right, we harvest our crops. Now it's time to plant again. Seeds, seeds, seeds. Fertilize them. Round up those babies. Grow, my darlings. Grow. Oh, crap. Now we've got super weeds. Yo. No, no, not super weed. Super weeds that are resistant to the glyphosate in Roundup. Now we're going to need something stronger because these weeds are tough. I guess we'll just get new herbicide-resistant seeds, and then new herbicides, like dicamba. Dicamba works by imitating a hormone in plants called auxin, which controls cell division and other parts of plant growth. Plants that get dicamba on them grow in abnormal and uncontrollable ways until they die. Ah, but now we've got even newer weeds, and our soil is dying and the plants are weak from becoming nutrient deficient, and now they're even more vulnerable to pests. Easy. We'll just spray, spray, spray on some pesticides. What are we going to spray here? How about the most commonly used organophosphate insecticide, malathion? Malathion is a pesticide that is widely used in agriculture, residential landscaping, public recreation areas, and in public health pest control programs, such as wiping out mosquito populations. Malathion kills insects by preventing their nervous system from working properly. When healthy nerves send signals to each other, a special chemical messenger travels from one nerve to another to carry the message. The nerve signal stops when an enzyme is released into the space between the nerves. Malathion binds to that enzyme and prevents the nerve signal from stopping and the constant nerve signals make it so the insects can't move or breathe normally, and they die. Malathion is classified by the United States Environmental Protection Agency as having suggestive evidence of carcinogenicity. That means it's likely that it causes cancer. This classification was based on the occurrence of liver tumors at excessive doses in mice and female rats and the presence of rare oral and nasal tumors in rats that occurred following exposure to very large doses. Researchers conducted a study involving participants from six Canadian provinces and found that exposure to organophosphates as a group, and malathion alone, was associated with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Okay, so that is one pesticide. But there's got to be another option, right? How about chlorpyrifos? Chlorpyrifos was invented as an alternative to the pesticide DDT. Chlorpyrifos also works by attacking insects' nervous systems. At high doses, such as what farmers get exposed to when they spray pesticides, it can cause people to experience nausea, dizziness, and confusion. 
Because of the potential health concerns, the EPA negotiated a deal with Dow Chemical to phase out all residential uses of chlorpyrifos in 2000, but this deal left the more profitable agricultural applications intact. One of the most tragic effects of regular exposure to chlorpyrifos is its potential to impair children's developing brains. When the residential use ban went into effect in 2000, it just so happened that a team of researchers at Columbia University was in the middle of recruiting participants for a study on childhood development. The ban allowed the researchers to split the study group into two halves, forming a natural experiment where the two groups of pregnant women were identical in every way, except that the earlier group was exposed to household chlorpyrifos during pregnancy, and the latter group was not. The researchers found that when children were exposed in the womb, they tended to be smaller, have poorer reflexes, and show higher signs of ADHD and other developmental disorders years after being exposed. Another team of researchers in Berkeley made similar findings. Since then, peer-reviewed publications have provided strong evidence for neurodevelopmental toxicity of chlorpyrifos. Only Dow Chemical, the inventor of chlorpyrifos, disagrees with this well-established scientific evidence, citing its own 40 years of high-quality animal research. Sit tight, because this is just the tip of the iceberg, and we're going to dive into the real star of our show right after the break. We'll also talk about how we can reduce our exposure and promote our overall health. Today's sponsor is me. I started this podcast to share my knowledge about the things that matter to me when it comes to making health-conscious decisions. I believe that everyone should have the tools to make their best decisions to reduce harm from their lives so they get the best chance at living a long, happy one. Even if we're just making a difference in the life of one person who listens to this podcast, that to me is worthwhile. This podcast is currently a solo project and it's pretty resource and time consuming. So if you believe in what I'm doing, or you just want to pick up some tips about how to add some health righteousness to your everyday life, follow Health Righteous on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, or visit our website. Just type Health Righteous, all one word, into your browser and drop a dot before the U.S. I thought that was a clever domain. And if this podcast means something to you, share it with somebody. Share it with somebody who you want to see live a health righteous life. And lastly, if you want to help me make this podcast sustainable, visit our Patreon, patreon.com slash health righteous. Any amount that you can contribute, even if it's just a few dollars, will help secure the resources we need to make this podcast something I can feasibly continue. Let's spread the gospel. All right, back to the show. So it sounds like malathion and chlorpyrifos are pretty dangerous. But at least our herbicide glyphosate is safe, right? Well, we mentioned that it kills off bacteria in the soil. And we talked about how bacteria in the human biome, or lack of that bacteria, can predict certain types of cancer. I think you can probably see where this is going. In one of the most recent studies, the University of Washington finds that exposure to glyphosate increases the risk of some cancers by 41%. But how can that be legal? The EPA should be protecting us from this. Isn't that their job? Their name is literally the Environmental Protection Agency. Well, they did. For a second. In March 1985, they classified glyphosate as Class C, possibly carcinogenic to humans after running a two-year study that caused some mice exposed to glyphosate to develop tumors at statistically significant rates, with no tumors at all in non-dosed mice. Monsanto pushed back, saying that they saw what looked like a tumor in the control group, in their opinion giving both groups the same results and removing any evidence of a carcinogen. One of the EPA pathologists says, It's not a tumor! But the rest of the EPA panel says, Even if it is a tumor, there's definitely an unusual amount of tumor incidences in the test group, and that is cause for concern. Monsanto says, your test proves nothing. Make it class D, not classifiable as carcinogenic to humans. The EPA panel says, just run another mouse trial. Monsanto says, no, we don't want to, we don't need to, there's no reason to. After a bunch of back and forth, the EPA scientists concede and dub the herbicide a Group E chemical, a classification that meant evidence of non-carcinogenicity for humans. So they're saying that there's evidence that it is not going to cause cancer in people. At least two members of the EPA committee refused to sign the report, stating that they did not concur with the findings. 
In a memo explaining the decision, agency officials offered a caveat. They wrote that the classification should not be interpreted as a definitive conclusion that the agent will not be a carcinogen under any circumstances. Boo. <laughs> Boo. Despite the EPA's ultimate conclusion, the mouse study was among those cited by the World Health Organization's International Agency for Research on Cancer in classifying glyphosate as a probable human carcinogen. Many other animal studies have similarly had questionable results, including a 1981 rat study that showed an increase in incidences of tumors in the testes of male rats and possible thyroid carcinomas in female rats exposed to glyphosate and a 1990 study that showed pancreatic tumors in exposed rats. But none have swayed the EPA from its backing of glyphosate safety. And why is that? Why would the EPA not live up to its reputation for protecting consumers? Let's take a look at some of the most recent names to emblazon the title of Head of the United States EPA. Here's Scott Pruitt. Scott Pruitt described himself as a, quote, leading advocate against the EPA's activist agenda while serving as Attorney General of Oklahoma. His website actually said those words. And Pruitt actively rejects the scientific consensus that human-caused carbon dioxide emissions are a primary contributor to climate change. He served as the head of the EPA from February 2017 to July 2018. On Halloween in 2017, he announced some new eligibility requirements for who could serve on the EPA's key scientific advisory boards and committees. These requirements replace the role of scientists with corporate interests, so take scientists off of the scientific advisory board and put corporations in control of what's safe. Got it. And remember chlorpyrifos? Mere weeks after being introduced to the CEO of Dow Chemical, Pruitt overruled EPA scientists and rejected an agency ban on chlorpyrifos, a nerve gas pesticide that caused neurological damage in children and infants, ensuring that this chemical will be spread on food crops and end up in our bodies. All right, so that's one bad apple. But he resigned. Enter Andrew Wheeler former coal lobbyist whose best-paying client prominently supports Trump for over 10 years. Wheeler says, quote, I share the core mission of the agency, which is to protect public health and the environment, end quote. Since taking over, the agency has moved to weaken fuel efficiency standards, air pollution safeguards, and the clean water rule, which impacts the drinking water supply for millions of Americans. So, surprising to no one at this point, the EPA's official stance is that they continue to find that there are no risks to public health when glyphosate is used in accordance with its current label and that glyphosate is not a carcinogen. The U.S. Secretary of Agriculture, Sonny Perdue, said, If we're going to feed 10 billion people by 2050, we are going to need all tools at our disposal, which includes the use of glyphosate. And yet, there has been no significant increase in crop yield as a result of glyphosate thus far. Hmm. All right. So we try to avoid processed soy and corn, and we should be pretty good, right? Well, that's a good start. But the thing about glyphosate is that it's water-soluble. So even if you're not eating a ton of soy and corn, if you're anywhere near farmland, it's in the ground, it's in the water, and it's even in the air you breathe. Yes, it was found in varying quantities across 75% of the air tested around the Mississippi Delta region. Some laud the use of glyphosate as a safer alternative to the herbicides of the past, and they may be right. Or maybe we just haven't been able to find out the true depth of glyphosate's reach yet, because with environmental exposure, it's harder to pinpoint. But here's where we're at. We know that it can possibly increase the incidence of cancer. So that's a piece of it. There's a name that came up a lot when I was digging for answers on this topic, and his name is Dr. Zach Bush. I hadn't heard of him until recently, but he's one of the few triple board certified physicians in the country with specialties of internal medicine, endocrinology and metabolism, and hospice and palliative care. He was student body president at the University of Colorado, then chief resident at the University of Virginia. His achievements include 
award-winning cellular biology, clinical care, and medical education. But the reason he kept reappearing in my research was that after 17 years of academic medicine, he changed course to start a nutrition-based education clinic in rural Virginia. And for nearly a decade, he's brought his attention to food, farming, and medical industries to educate, inspire, and present solutions to some of the crises that we're currently facing in agriculture. Here's what he's been up to. Dr. Bush has researched and published on the topic that there's a correlation between glyphosate exposure and the behavior of tight junctions in the gut. I'm going to need you to stick with me on this one because it is about to get real scientific up in here. Tight junctions are a one to two cell barrier that protects vertebrates like us by preventing antigens and pathogens from entering the mucous tissues and causing diseases. So he says there's a relationship between glyphosate and tight junctions, which isn't entirely far-fetched when we start to learn that intestinal bacteria communicate and change the expression and distribution of tight junctions. Let me say that again. The intestinal bacteria, that's the microbes in our gut, they communicate and change the formation of these tight junctions, aka the barrier inside our bodies. In some cases, probiotics lead to an increase in tight junctions at our cell boundaries and prevent or reverse the negative effects of pathogens. But remember what glyphosate does to bacteria? Not good. In 2011, the Journal of Nutrition published a very thorough study that concluded that increased intestinal permeability, or the ability for things to pass through our tight junctions, is implicated in autoimmune, inflammatory, and atopic diseases. Inflammatory bowel disease and celiac disease are characterized by a leaky intestinal barrier, and type 1 diabetes patients also have more permeability in their small intestines. But it doesn't stop there. The article keeps on rolling to multiple sclerosis in the brain because tight junctions aren't limited to the gut. It goes on to say that entry of antigens, or bacteria and viruses that are bad for you, can lead to systemic inflammation response syndrome and multiple organ failure. And Dr. Bush thinks it's a huge cause of the uptick in cases of child autism as well. Woo! Thank you for writing that out with me. That got a little dark for a minute. So I want to come back to celiac disease. Celiac disease is one of the symptoms of failing tight junctions, but apparently gluten can also exacerbate these same issues with that tight junction barrier. We know that celiac disease is an immune disease in which people can't eat gluten because it will damage their small intestine. And gluten is a protein found in wheat, rye, and barley. Documented cases of celiac disease continue to rise. According to the University of Chicago, celiac disease affects 1% of healthy average Americans. That means at least 3 million people in our country are living with celiac disease. Many are asymptomatic, and between 80 and 97% of them are undiagnosed. Okay, so I think there's something interesting here. The glyphosate in Roundup kills plants and the microbiome in the soil. It gets sprayed a lot and ends up as residue in our food, but also in our water and air. We get exposed to glyphosate and it starts to kill off our microbiome, which in theory can lead to a disruption in our tight junctions and thus become celiac disease and a host of other medical issues. But here's the interesting part. Celiac disease also has implications in triggering non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and there are currently over 18,000 lawsuits awaiting trial against Monsanto, but the first of which have been shown to be encouraging. On August 10th, 2018, Monsanto goes to trial for the first time in a case citing glyphosate-based herbicides by one Dwayne Johnson. Not Dwayne the Rock Johnson, but Dwayne Johnson. He has non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and was awarded $289 million in damages which was later cut to $78 million on appeal, after a jury in San Francisco found that Monsanto had failed to adequately warn consumers of cancer risks posed by the herbicide. Johnson had routinely used two different glyphosate formulations in his work as a groundskeeper. Court documents from this case show the company's efforts to influence scientific research via ghostwriting. They wrote and distributed 
evidence and circulated it to scientists to reinforce their safety claims. Shady. In March 2019, in the first federal trial, a man was awarded $80 million in a lawsuit claiming that Roundup was a substantial factor in his cancer. This resulted in Costco stores discontinuing sales. In July 2019, his settlement was reduced to $25 million. And in May of 2019, a jury in California ordered Bayer to pay a couple $2 billion in damages after finding that the company had failed to adequately inform consumers of the possible carcinogenicity of Roundup. This settlement was reduced to $86.7 million because the judgment exceeded legal precedent. But even as this podcast is being made, there's a court battle being fought in Monsanto's home state of Missouri. Well, this is good news for these people whose lives have been significantly altered because of exposure to Roundup. But what about the rest of us? What can we do to mitigate risks in our daily lives? Well, there's a few things, actually. The first is to buy organic produce. I know, I know, it's an expensive hurdle that many just aren't willing to take. But the way I look at it, you're not just throwing away whatever nominal amount of extra cash you're spending on that organic produce. It's an investment. It's saying, hey, you know what? I deserve to eat something that's less dangerous. Yes, I said less dangerous, because unfortunately, even organic farms fall victim to herbicide and pesticide runoff and rain and air contamination. But what we do know is that it will contain less glyphosate and dicamba and less malathion and chlorpyrifos. It's also worth considering when going out to eat at restaurants, because unless otherwise specified, it's safe to assume that they'll be using conventional produce and probably soybean oil. The Detox Project also offers a unique glyphosate residue-free certification. Products bearing this seal have been tested to meet quality standards. This seal might not be super widespread, but it's currently the best way to make sure that what you're ingesting is free of glyphosate residue. What else can we do? We can soak our produce, conventional or organic. Soaking your produce in water with baking soda or apple cider vinegar for 15 minutes takes off a fair amount of nasties. Whereas rinsing, like we've probably done our entire lives, does good to wash the dirt off, but doesn't do nearly as much as soaking. The apple cider vinegar might change the taste of your produce, so with baking soda, use about one teaspoon of baking soda for two cups of water. Vegetable brushes are also a good additional line of defense. Here's another way. Dr. Zach Bush sells a product that's designed to protect the tight junctions in your gut called Ion Gut Health, formerly called Restore. His product claims to increase the body's production of beneficial enzymes to strengthen those tight junctions from glyphosate and gluten. A one month supply runs about $50. I haven't taken the leap yet, but I imagine I'll try it out since I'm gluten sensitive. I've got to admit though, I am going to be skeptical of any scientist or doctor who sells a product but from everything I've seen, his evidence checks out with me. And he's also got a side project called Farmer's Footprint, in which he hopes to regenerate 5 million acres of farmland by 2025. He's got a short film you can watch for free on farmersfootprint.us. So we know we can buy organic, soak our produce, and maybe consider this Ion Gut Health. But there's one more solution I want to suggest, and that's growing your own produce. This one definitely takes the most work, but it's probably the best way you can ensure that your food meets your own safety standards. Maybe look for some organic seeds, start composting and use that nutrient-rich soil, and taste the freshness yourself. I just bought some growing kits online, but I'll probably have to wait until after winter to grow anything, because it gets cold up here in Washington. Ooh. Okay, so that is the doom and gloom side of GMOs, but it's only half the story. Well, I mean, it's not anywhere near half the story, but it's the half of the story that I can squeeze into this podcast. Keep on binging and roll right on to episode two of GMO Giants and Dirty Produce, and we'll look at the brighter side of GMOs. The thing about health is that we don't really see its full value until we start to lose it. So let's help each other reduce harm from our everyday lives. If you learned something today and you want to share it with someone, Pass this podcast along to your friends, your family, your enemies, your exes, anyone who has made your life interesting that could benefit from a dose of health. And get at me. Follow Health Righteous on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. 
visit our website, type Health Righteous into your browser, all one word, and drop a dot before the U.S. Join the movement. In all honesty, I had a blast making this episode, but it took a long time. I'd love to make more of these and see what we can achieve together. Maybe it's an app, maybe it's a restaurant, so consider becoming a patron. I'm currently accepting patrons on Patreon and sponsorship of many kinds, so visit patreon.com slash healthrighteous or shoot me a DM. Thank you, thank you, thank you for valuing your own health and the health of each other. And tell me what you're passionate about and would like to hear me cover in a future episode. Health Righteous! If you're still listening, I've got a little present for you. In this episode, we talked about buying organic, but if you're a conscious consumer like me, you might be interested in knowing the companies that Monsanto might be selling genetically modified seeds to. But since this is a podcast, you can't read a list of names, so I made a humiliating song for you instead. It looks like Monsanto sold seeds to the farmers who grow the ingredients for these companies. Ahem. Aunt Jemima, Aurora Banquet, Best Foods, Betty Crocker, Bisquick, Cadbury, Campbell's, Capri Sun, Carnation, <laughs> Chef Boyardee, Coca-Cola, Conegra, Delicious Brand, Cookies, Duncan Hines, Famous Amos, Frito-Lay, General Mills, Green Giant, Healthy Choice, Heinz, Hellman's, Hershey's, Nestle, Wholesome, Hungry Jack, Hunt's, Interstate Bakeries, Jiffy, Casey Masterpiece, Keebler Flowers, Kellogg's, Kid Cuisine, Nor Kool-Aid, Kraft Philip Morris, Lean Cuisine, Lip. Loma Linda, Murray Calendars, Minimade, Morningstar, Mrs. Butterworth, Nabisco, Nature Valley, Ocean Spray, or Ida, Orville Redenbacher, Passeroni, Pepperidge Farms, Pepsi, Pillsbury, Pop Secret, Post Cereals, Power Bar, Prego, Pringles, Procter & Gamble, Quaker Ray, Goo, rice Smart Smart One, Stouffer's, Schweppes, Tombstone Pizza, Totino's, Uncle Ben's, Unilever V8. Ha <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>